are here and especially to have Eric here today. What a great uh, Tuesday and like all these different faces, um, a treat. Um, so uh, hunker down, dive into your food um, and get ready uh, for uh, what is uh, sure to be an engaging conversation. Um, before uh, we get to that, however, uh, just to let you know, you're being uh, recorded, webcast and so forth. Uh, so if you have an issue with that, um, you should probably go hide somewhere um, and or, or say things that you want to be shared, which would be the alternative that we'd prefer around here. Um, uh, and uh, maybe just begin by going around the room so Eric knows to whom he's speaking. We could just start right back here in the back corner with Deborah. Oh, thanks. I, um, my name is Deborah Finn. Um, I'm a consultant that works for nonprofits and foundations on their tech strategy. Um, helping them align their tech uh, information communication technologies with their mission. I'm Maria Lukovic, fellow at the Brooklyn Center. I'm Christopher, I'm a business consultant. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Chu, um, computer scientist, retired with Harvard's Mind uh, on Learning Institute. I'm Eric Roberts, uh, associate at the Consensus Building Institute. I'm Jesse, former intern here. Uh, recently quit my job to uh, spend more time with my parents. Congratulations, Dakota, things like that. I am uh, Dorothea. I'm a visiting researcher from London, University of London, um, where I direct the ICTPD Center. And I was here in 2010, so I'm delighted to be back here. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Felicia Sullivan. I'm at Tufts University. My name is Kay Kalashina Ginsburg. I work at Circle. My name is Jing Da Liu. I'm from Kennedy School. Dahlia Topolson, clinical instructor at the Cyber Law Clinic here at Berkman. I'm the Jones Berkman staff. <laughs> Mary McCrossan, you said you I'm Raj for Berkman staff. Can you guys in the back have to speak up because these are kind of like jet engines at this end of the table, <laughs> even though they don't really work that way. I am Charu Gupta. I'm a communications community based consultant for nonprofits. Nikhil Galwat. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. I'm Catherine Ramey. I teach at Emerson College. Dawn Hellyer with ICON. Willow Grew, Recent Addition to your Center for Civic Media. I'm Rowan Curran, a research associate at Forrester Research. I'm Ryan Yiddish, and I'm a fellow here at the Center. Paul Cosway, a Cambridge based entrepreneur, doing some work in uh, social publishing and social learning. Ron Newman, software developer. Edward Buker, I can music app developer. Uh, Aaron Napperstack, MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Dalida Maria Benfield, I'm a Berkman Fellow. Robert Call, um, a technology consultant. I also do some OS development in my free time. Um, and that's about it. Marcy Murninghan, I'm sort of from all over the place. <laughs> I have a doctorate from the Ed School, and my work for the last 30 years has been on how to make uh, capitalism more ethical on corporate responsibility front. An audited course from Chris Deed on game design, and I'm looking at the use of online tools for more civic engagement on money and power fronts and fighting corruption. Irene Greif, I'm at IBM Research here in Cambridge, and I do social software, social business, crowdfunding, social learning. I'm Peter Suber, I'm a Berkman Fellow, and I work on open access to research. I'm Saul Tannenbaum, I'm a citizen journalist and activist for civic engagement here in Cambridge. I'm Nathaniel Lee Bim on staff mm -hmm. here at the Berkman Center. I'm Emma Raviv, a second year student at the law school and a former um, cyber law clinic student here at Berkman. I'm Deborah, I'm from Brazil, and I'm part of Transparency Hacker in Brazil, and I'm organizing an event uh, called Rethink Relief at uh, D-Lab MIT. I'm Hal Bloom, I'm a recently retired librarian and IT manager, last at the Business School Library. I'm Margaret Weidel, a digital researcher and producer from Harvard and MIT. I'm Tom Stites of the Banyan Project, and I was a fellow here in 2010-11. I'm Laura Miko. I'm a Nina Park fellow. Awesome. <clears throat> what a group. I think uh, with uh, a group like y'all, this is going to be a really interesting conversation. Uh, it's clearly a testament to the groundbreaking work that Eric and his team are doing 
um, our kind of interest in uh, this engagement game lab uh, vision, this new vision for what civic um, civics looks like, what civic engagement lo looks like, what civic learning looks like, um, gamification or not, maybe there's another better way to describe it. Um, I'm uh, just really thrilled that Eric is doing this check-in with us. He's just finished a, um, uh, a project in Salem, Mass, where I live, which I had the great pleasure of uh, seeing a bit of as my wife and her students participate in it. It was totally awesome. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways, I, you came first to Berk Berkman Center about five years ago, six years ago? Something like that. Which is, so it's been an awesome yeah. journey to see Eric over this time kind of starting to get interested in this stuff and just diving into it and sticking with it in a way um, that has evolved and led to this um, really interesting scholarship uh, and really interesting engagement with the world and blending those two in uh, novel, robust, um, but also uh, um, productive ways. So I know we'll just get a slice of that today, but I'm really excited for the slice. So uh, Eric, take it away. Thank you so much, Colin. And uh, I just thanks to everyone at the Berkman Center for making this possible. It's pretty exciting to see all these people uh, together in this room. And I will try to leave my remarks uh, short enough so that we can have the conversation that I think, as Colin says, will be uh, pretty great, hopefully. So the, the title of my talk, uh, Beyond Participation, Civic Engagement Through an Online Game. And, um, and I'll explain what I mean by that, hopefully, as, as, we, as we go on. So, I'm going to start off by establishing the, the problem. So the problem as I see it, and the way that uh, games are, um, that we're designing games to be deployed within this space, is that there are a few clear pathways to interface with government uh, for citizens. One problem. Another problem is that platforms for interaction and feedback tend to be poorly designed. So if we think about these, uh, these moments of interfacing between, between government and citizens, um, we tend to focus on the, uh, the sort of um, tried and true town hall meeting um, and often leave it at that. Um, and the issue is we have a lot of room here to create, to create opportunities that allow people to meaningfully not only interface with, with government, but with organizations and other people um, in a community context that um, can be pretty extraordinary, and I think there's a, a lot of opportunity here um, to design around that problem. And then finally, public feedback is conflated with civic engagement. And what I mean by that is um, there is a mandate in, in most states uh, in the United States and, and in other parts of the world to engage the public, and the, t the term is often used, um, the, the word engage is often used. That mandate, however, uh, is often tied to, uh, to a concept of maximum feasible participation, which was uh, an outcropping of the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964. Um, but often what happens is, is minimum possible effort to achieve that. And, and that's a problem because, again, we have a mandate. There is a, a desire to, there is a need because of the mandate to reach people. But the quality of that reaching is, is, uh, is little understood, I think. And what I mean by public feedback being conflated with civic engagement is that public agencies will seek feedback without thinking about the capacity building that's required to get communities to understand what it is that they're providing feedback to, um, and without providing them the opportunity to um, use that encounter or that, um, that moment of providing feedback in, in a way that's more productive. All right. So the the focus has been, because of this, on this idea of participation. So, and participation within the municipal government context and the state government context is, uh, is a numbers game. So uh, to satisfy a mandate, cities or state agencies attempt to touch a certain amount of people. Um, and uh, often the quality of that touch, as I said before, is, is, uh, is not um, all that well explored. Um, so, but that is, but, but what happens is that agencies will typically report on how many people were touched, and that means how many people attended a meeting, how many people posted on Facebook in some cases, um, although that's another issue that we'll talk about a little later, um, and, and how many people received messages. So the, these are things that, that we're keeping track of. 
the focus is on efficiency of reach. So within an established context of public participation. So um, if we call 10 meetings over the course of uh, over the course of a year, will we achieve um, the amount of people that we need um, within the context of that meeting, which which we understand, which is politically uncomplicated, um, and and which will um, which will essentially cut the mustard in the sense. And what I mean by that is um, when you propose a different kind of interaction with the public, there's often political work that needs to happen in order to legitimize that that. Um, that alternate mode of engagement. So many public agencies simply fall back on, on, a, on a concept of the town hall meeting that has been relatively unchallenged for, for a long time. So the local capacity building is um, often part of, uh, is, is not uh, often a part of state mandates. Um, it does not include efficacious communities, building social capital, neighborhood belongingness, et cetera. And it's the, what, what I like to call in this, in this realm, this idea of meaningful inefficiencies. So can we get, um, in the government context, can we get government to focus on meaningful inefficiencies? Um, can we focus on these things that are difficult to quantify, but are quite possible with, um, with creative design solutions? Um, for instance, how do, you, how do you measure collective efficacy in a way that makes sense? Um, is that part of the mandate that, that um, city governments have or state governments have to their constituents um, to actually build, collect, to build efficacy amongst uh, communities or, or not? Um, so, so put that in your mind, meaningful inefficiencies, and let's see where that, that goes. Um, it's not that this doesn't happen, and there are, there are very creative ways in which meaningful efficiencies are, are taking place. Um, some examples here, um, the roaming table, for instance, in Detroit, Michigan, was a, was a great example of a, of a table. This was a part of the planning process that Detroit did uh, just last year, where they, they built a table and they, they took it out into, into the public and just had conversations with people. And it wasn't really about collecting data per se, but it was about talking to people, being a sort of face of a, a quasi-governmental governmental organization. Um, within uh, within a city that was uh, very hard to um, to efficiently connect with, with citizens, so um, the roaming table, as I said, is, is a fascinating example because while they did report on these people as numbers that they reached, so it did qualify uh, their efficiency standards, uh, but on the other hand, the 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 numbers I think were um, were composed of conversations that that didn't that didn't produce anything recognizable in the in the town hall uh, forum. Um, design charrettes, some of you may be familiar with the concept of design charrettes, but uh, design charrettes are, are typically take place over several hours to several days. They, um, they invite people into, uh, into a community center, often um, using um, blocks or, or paper or, or, um, or crayons even, and, and people really um, understand the elements of design that goes into any particular problem and work to solve those problems and create alternatives um, to, to what exists. Um, in this case, this is, a, this is an image from a design charrette in Rochester, New York about a transportation plan. But what's interesting is with all these design charrettes is that they're, they're difficult to think about how you scale something like this because they're, they're so, um, they, they require so much time um, on the part of, of uh, citizens to participate. And then this is an example on the bottom here is a, a game that, um, that, um, that I did with my lab called Participatory Chinatown, which was uh, a game that was a, um, that was a game that was a, a digital game. It was a role-playing game, and it was a, um, a, a game where people would walk around the city, of, walk around the Chinatown neighborhood as a character and kind of solve problems for, um, for their character um, within, within the game. But it all took place within the context of a meeting. So it was really a LAN. Um, that we set up within community meetings, and we reach probably about 200 people with the with the entire game. So a lot of uh, intensity around capacity building within that community meeting, but difficult uh, to scale um, because it was based on the face-to-face -face interactions of people within the space. All right. So uh, how does the uh, how how do new technologies? And what I mean by that is uh, generally the internet, and we can we can get um, we can close in on that a little bit more as we go. But how does this change um, what's possible within the civic realm? 
So how, the, how have the social conditions born of social media changed standard conceptions of civic life? So what I mean by that is, how do citizens think about the public sphere uh, and, and their desire and ability to connect? Um, and how have practices through online, how, do, how have online practices changed expectations amongst, uh, amongst uh, citizens to uh, intersect with the public, with public life? A related question, and we haven't talked too much about this yet, but one that I'm, we want to talk about, is how have the social conditions born of digital games changed standard conceptions of civic life? So in this case, uh, can we say that um, because gameplay is such a major part of, of so many people's lives, can we say that, this, that the structure and expected interactions of games um, have actually changed expectations of what it, what it looks like to, um, to interact with complex systems? Uh, and can we, can we mobilize um, some of those changed expectations? And then here's the normative question. How should these new conditions change public processes? So um, if we assume that there, or if we can assume for a moment that there are new conditions, new social conditions, um, including qualities of, of networks, including the archivability of, of participation, meaning that online participation is, is potentially there in perpetuity, unlike a town hall meeting, um, including uh, mobility and locality, um, uh, the sort of anytime, anywhere uh, concept of, of inter interacting with public life, and then including qualities of play. Um, and and is, it, is it wise, uh, or can we think in a, in a normative sense, can we think about integrating play as a serious concept in, in the way that we think about uh, civic interactions. All right, so there is a, a landscape of tools that is rich uh, in, this, in this regard, and I just want to go over some of them very quickly. Um, and, and I've broken them up into three general categories uh, of tools that, that are, are mobile and or web-based that are sort of taking advantage of civic technology, or taking advantage of network technologies to um, integrate or enhance um, civic life. So in the feedback realm, there is a, a, an application called uh, Textizen, which is uh, something that was designed um, by uh, Code for America, uh, I think first in partnership with, um, with Philadelphia. And it's essentially a feedback tool um, that allows, uh, that allows um, uh, people to essentially text in a response to a question. So I know that they recently did this in Philadelphia where they uh, they had uh, in, the, in, in the subways and around the city, there was just a, a prompt. You know, what do you think about this? And, and allowed people to, to text in their, their responses. Um, and they, they were able to, to get hundreds of, of, uh, of, of comments uh, through this tool. Um, another tool called MindMixer, which is, uh, which is a, a kind of planning platform um, that, that allows people to uh, create prompts, um, it allows administrators and people to sort of create prompts to to get feedback around particular planning issues. So this has been used in cities uh, all over the country that, um, that, has been, that has been focused on, again, kind of um, specific channels of interactions. So, um, so what do you think about this? Uh, what can we do about this? And, and get, people to, uh, get people to respond in a, in a, clean, um, in a, in a clean online interface. Um, the other, so that's, that's feedback. There's local communication, which, um, which is sort of neighborhood networking. So neighborhood networks take place in, you know, in, the, in, in some ways the most basic version is like Google groups. Uh, neighborhood Google groups are, are nearly ubiquitous. Um, but beyond that, there are tools that are specifically designed to, uh, to create neighborhood connections, like Nextdoor, which is a fairly new startup in this space uh, that, is, uh, that tries to get neighbors to connect with each other on various way, in various ways, allows, the, allows people to sell goods and, uh, on, online within a local context, and, and creates a, there's a, um, a system that, that uh, legitimizes um, through, you actually have to get a postcard and send it back to, to, to prove that you live there. So it, it tries to sort of um, keep that network cohesive iNeighbors is one that's been around for some time that was developed out of um, University of Pennsylvania. Um, and this is an interesting, again, kind of local neighborhood network that does what it sounds like it does, uh, which is connect people within localities, get people sharing, knowing each other, um, and, and being able to exchange uh, goods and services on a local level. Um, then there's this whole realm of reporting tools. So you have things like C-Click Fix, uh, which is a um, which is a mobile reporting tool where you can report potholes, um, graffiti, anything else that bothers you at the moment. 
Um, and then um, down here, we, there's one that was, uh, which is called Citizens Connect, was developed in the city of Boston by the uh, mayor's office of New River Mechanics. And um, Citizens Connect does something similar, but it, it tries to better integrate with service delivery. So you'll get a report saying that um, your, your job is now closed, it's been done, and you'll, you'll even uh, get some feedback about it if it's appropriate. So again, it's direct interface with, uh, with government in this case, um, but, but uh, not, not, exactly, um, not exactly social in this case. All right, so the way that I want to um, kind of intervene into this space is within this concept of civic learning. And um, as I see it, this infographic is, uh, is the best I can do. But, uh, but, he but here you go. This is a, in this infographic, it, it, it should demonstrate absolutely clearly uh, to you what I mean. So maybe I don't even need to talk. Um, but as participation, what we've been talking about are, are elements of participation. And um, it's, it's a, you know, connect with a, connect with a neighbor. Um, perhaps it's a, a connect with government on a, in a kind of transactive form. Um, make those transactions more efficient, essentially, is what a lot of these tools do, and a lot of what, a, a lot of what mobile and web-based applications have been able to provide. Um, and these things, these, uh, these acts of participation are driven by interest and desire and need. So the people who r report on Citizens Connect, for instance, are doing so because they care about the pothole. They care about the fact that the person next to them hasn't shoveled for a week, or, you know, there, there's a... Uh, we're actually doing a, a, some research on that specifically, and we're sort of dividing things up in uh, public reports and private supports, uh, private reports. So if I'm reporting about, um, you know, the snow in front of my house, that's different than if I'm reporting about the condition of a community center, for instance. So, um, but they're still transactive. It's still about an individual transacting with a, with a, a government agency. Um, but but those, that interest and desire and need, the, what I'm interested in is how do we take that um, and, and cultivate something that might be approaching engagement. So engagement meaning that, and I tie this into this concept of, of civic learning. And, and here I, I'm indebted to, to John Dewey, um, where um, he talks about civic, he talks about learning, he doesn't talk about civic learning, but he talks about learning in, um, and he says that it requires a structure of interaction. Uh, and facilitates the learner's actions and directs them to a greater purpose. So uh, Dewey says, a purpose is an end view. It involves foresight of the consequences which will result from acting upon impulse. So if we take these actions um, of people acting upon impulse and we provide an end view, if we create a structure, a system um, that, that, uh, that makes sense, then we can arrive at what, what Dewey talks about as being learning which is the ability to uh, associate not only the uh, not only the action with a particular end goal, but the but having the possibility of reflection within taking that action. So, and what I'm interested in is how can we take the, this this civic space and cultivate something like civic learning, where we add within these these various participatory actions that um, that are happening through through multiple modes of, of connection. Can we take that and actually um, organize it so that it's that sense making within that space is possible for individual citizens, and the ability to reflect is is possible and even desirable? All right. So why games then? Um, I mean, this is this is interesting. I hope uh, so. Games, in some ways, are are, are a very convenient way of of framing processes, and that's in some ways that's the that's that's what they do. Um, they're capable of simplifying complex systems with a clear rule set. Um, they games can create clear objectives. Um, they can provide regular feedback towards achieving those project regular feedback towards achieving those objectives, and they can provide opportunities for reflection. This idea of of Making a game out of out of city planning is certainly not new. Um, it's um, apt associates started doing this in the 1960s and um, within the realm of serious games. And I, I actually have this wonderful quote from um, um, from the Architectural Forum in 1968 in reference to um, games such as Metropolis and, and Neighborhood, which were some of Apt's games, um, also developed out of the um, of Michigan State. Um, 
But in the magazine, it says a game which reduces the world to a comprehensible whole and gives each player the same frame of reference can go a long way toward giving him an understanding of his own concerns in relation to the total picture. So that's been a real influence um, on, on, uh, on my work, certainly. Um, the, the idea that if we can, that we can boil down those complex rule systems um, into something that, it, that approximates a comprehensible whole, not to be pandering, but in a way to simplify, to make things more, um, to make things easier to latch onto um, within the civic space, um, and then give people an opportunity to reflect um, is, what, is what games certainly have the power to do. Related to this is the element of fun, which we haven't talked about much, and it's um, somewhat complicated. But fun in the, 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 the notion of a, a discovery or exploration or challenge or even difficulty um, within this. Um, being able to, um, um, I was just actually uh, reading, Jesper Ewell has a, a great new book out about, the, the, about failure within, within video games. And, and specifically referring to this idea of, of, uh, of, of structured, structured um, useful failure, essentially. And, and I've been thinking about that in terms of the, the civic space as well. Um, people fail all the time um, in, in civic life. Um, you know, every interaction with government is in some ways uh, always already a failure. And so how do you actually structure that in a way where it is, uh, is meaningful, where there's, um, where there's possibilities to not only learn from failure, but to, but to fail safely? All right, um, so the, the, what I want to talk about is a case study of, uh, of a game that, that we've developed, a game platform that we've developed called um, Community Planet. And let me just introduce this by showing a, a little teaser video. Okay, well, the next item on the agenda is vacant lot number 8934. Ah, uh, yes, Lot 8934. No high-rises, no museums, no parks. We have plenty of these things in our town. I'll tell you what we need. A state-of-the-art parking lot. Oh, that or a landfill. Hmm. If only there was a way to involve the community in this process. That's preposterous. I don't see how that could ever work. You're suggesting we let the community plan it. The game doesn't have music, uh, unfortunately, but I wish it did. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the teaser, and let me t explain to you more about what it is. The goal of the game is to, is to earn coins and pledge them to causes. Um, and, and at the game's end, the top three causes win cash pri a cash prize. So, um, and it's usually around $500 is what goes to these, these local causes. You earn coins by, by, um, by answering questions or completing challenges. And that can be just answering questions about your opinions. Um, it could be submitting uh, images or, or, or videos. Um, it could be mapping points. Um, and, and then also there, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, the structure is three time-based missions. So the game takes place over time. And um, one of the things that's important to, to us about this is the element of narrative and how, um, how in any kind of planning context, even if it's not municipal planning, um, there, is a, there is a lot of affordances to, to good narrative. So how you can build tension, you can, you can create some interesting structure, 
around letting things unfold over time. So it's and which is different than the again the sort of transactive model of of uh, the meeting that that happens and then it and then it doesn't. Um, each mission has about 12 challenges, and there are open-ended, multiple choice, map, empathy challenges. Empathy challenges are when you're introduced to a character and you have to solve a problem for that character. Um, every time you interface with these challenges, you don't see anybody else's responses until you submit, and then you're brought into a, a sort of a world with, with everybody's, um, everybody's responses. As you see down here, they're kind of, they, they look something like this, um, and it gives you a chance to interact with them. And you can earn awards for doing things like uh, liking liking things or um, commenting on things. There's a, the whole award mechanism that gives you more points for um, doing the kinds of behaviors that we're trying to get you to do uh, within the game. Um, each mission has four trivia barriers that are represented by by these little guys, which we call crats or technocrats, um, and they they test you on your knowledge as you as you go. And they're um, they're a little bit pesky, but people seem to. It's funny, um, during the game, people would, would respond to these crats. They would, some people on their, on their profile would say, uh, their tagline, would, they, um, a couple of people said, uh, I'm here to beat the crats. And so there was a real sort of interesting sort of animosity um, against these people that are, that are trying to help you, but they're doing so in a way that is unpleasant. Um, and, then, and then at the end, there, at the very end of a mission, there's the boss level, um, which you, um, you, where you meet the, the big, the big boss crat that gives you a more difficult question and uh, um, and gives you a, a, a greater uh, greater reward if you get the question right. Um, and then each game ends with a face-to-face -face, uh, game finale meeting. So we try to structure an entire process around this kind of online um, goes to, to offline. And usually in the game finale meeting, we only get about 10% of game players. But um, and that's well, that's that's what it is. Um, the goal goal of the game is this, to create a context for civic learning, as, as, I'm, as I've described it. I mean, this means provide opportunities for communities to learn from each other and visualize social connections, um, to understand community priorities, and to understand trade-offs and complexity of process. So those are the, the general learning goals of the game. That's tied to other learning goals, like bring more people into the process. Um, this is something that I know for, um, in the case of planners or city officials, as I was saying before, the focus on, on quantity is, is, is significant and real. Um, and, and people's jobs essentially are on the line um, if they can't get the quantity. So I, I just had a conversation with a planner this morning um, who wanted to know precisely um, how, many, uh, how many people um, were new to the process. So, uh, and, that's, and that's really an important thing. So if we're going to do something that's not the town hall meeting, yeah, we're going to get more people um, into it, but how many of those people have never been to any kind of um, meeting before? And that's a really interesting sort of um, number for, for planners especially. And then increased quality of data produced. And this is tied to the uh, initial frame that I, that I provided, which is this idea that, um, that engagement is different than um, engagement in something is different than feedback. And I think too much of the priority has been on getting a quantity of feedback and not necessarily on the quality of feedback that may just be, and I don't really have convincing data here yet, but may just be connected to the level of engagement. So if we engage people more, create, create robust learning environments, the feedback should be better. And it's something that I, I want to look at specifically, but it's certainly a driving um, theory at the moment, or at least a hypothesis. Um, OK, so I want to talk about a couple of case studies and, uh, and two completed ones. Uh, and those are, um, one, we did a, a, a game in the Boston Public Schools um, around education planning back in September and October of 2011. Here's some basic stats, 35 days, about 500 players, 4,600 comments in the system. Um, and then we recently, last year, we did a, a game in the city of Detroit around the master planning effort. Um, and uh, the Detroit Future City document was recently released a couple weeks ago that was, was littered with, the, um, with data that was generated through the, the game. So it went directly into, the, the, um, into that document. 
um, which was just announced got a $150 million from the Kresge Foundation to implement some of that, but we'll see what, what actually happens there. Um, 21 days, the game in Detroit, about 1,000 players and about 8,600 comments um, in the system. And we'll talk about, like, I, I'm focusing on quantity here, as, you'll, as you see, but quantity is complicated as well, um, you know, for, for, uh, for planners. So when you get all of this data, um, what do you do with it is another interesting issue. And it's another, it's, it's, the, it's the question of responsiveness from the, from the public sector and, and, and government, essentially, with this feedback. And so I wanna, I'll talk about that a little bit later. And here's some case studies in progress that I want to talk about, and they're really um, very new, so um, I'll say a few things about them, but we just finished these two games, um, one in Salem, Massachusetts, as Colin, Colin mentioned. Um, this is in the Point neighborhood in Salem, and it was a visioning process, and it just completed uh, about a week and a half ago, I guess. Uh, it went 21 days, uh, about 600 players, and about 5,000 comments in a very small neighborhood in Salem, only about 4,000 people, yeah. Um, we don't know, uh, I don't know, I can't tell you exactly how many of those people came from that neighborhood yet, but, um, but it's still a good amount of people. Philadelphia, we did a game on the University City Southwest area, so it was right around UPenn and then the neighborhood surrounding UPenn, the Southwest, what the planners call Southwest. I don't know if people actually call it Southwest. No. Um, what do they call it? Yeah, there's like three different neighborhoods. Yeah. We, okay. But, that, but the general area is the area around Southwest, um, around University City, which is not an affluent area. Um, and uh, in that game, uh, again, 21 days, about 900 players and about 9,100 comments um, in, in that system um, during that time. So, um, so those are the two in-progress case studies. Um, just quickly, a little bit about how we're, how we're doing the research here. Um, mostly qualitative. We, um, we interview um, players and, and, and planners. Uh, we do um, semi-structured open-ended interviews, um, or semi-structured interviews, I should say, with planners. Um, we we uh, do focus groups with youth, and we, we tend to have, um, and I haven't talked much about the youth component, but in all of our games, we, we have youth involved in different ways from the design of the content uh, to, the, to the outreach and the implementation. So we've, we've done it in different ways, um, and I can talk more about that. Um, we observe uh, play sessions and, and meetings um, during, the, during, um, during the process, and then there's a, an online survey component um, to it as well. So here are the driving questions. Can an online game enable lateral trust to motivate participation and build confidence in process? So two things there, motivate participation and build confidence in process, and, and I'll get more into that. Um, can an online game create flexible publics to legitimize participation? And can an online game enable social learning opportunities to increase collective efficacy? All right, so let me go a little bit deeper into each of those things. Um, this question of lateral trust. Players, this is probably no surprise. Players tended not to trust the institution sponsoring the game. So in, in all of the cases, players reported that they, they did not, in the case of BPS, uh, Boston Public Schools, they did not trust the Boston Public Schools to, um, to, uh, to do anything. Um, and they certainly did not trust the city of Detroit um, to do anything. And so here's a, just a quote from a, one of the Detroit players. There's a deep history that goes back decades in the city of Detroit, particularly with community planning issues, of people being told this is what it's going to be or having a community planning input session as just a formality because the law says we have to take community input. So we'll write people's input down on a piece of paper and then put it on a, on a shelf somewhere. And this was a pretty common sentiment um, that, and, and not wrong. Um, and so it's a, you know, and this is, this is a, a, an interesting challenge, right? Because, yeah. So the other thing about, about building trust, so here's where we're starting from. Players came to the game, however, through social connections or trusted community organizations. So very few players said they came to the game because, um, because the city told them to or because the school district told them to. Um, they, they came to the game because a community organization that they're tied to told them to or, or someone in their social network um, you know, told them to. Again, not, it's a no-brainer. Um, it's, it's clearly the way that people would come to these things, but it's not something that government tends to focus on. Um, through gameplay, players developed lateral trust relationships that would affect their social framing of issues and willingness to engage. 
And so what I mean by that is that the that what players tended to trust in is what other players had to say. And they, the relationships that developed in the game were not necessarily personal relationships that developed. Like people weren't um, necessarily, uh, you know, taking long walks on the beach together, but, but they were trusting in each other and, and they were familiar with, 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 um, with each other's avatars, essentially, within the game. By the way, people in the game use their first name and last initial to identify themselves, so it's sort of semi-anonymous. Um, and, 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 and it's in that. It's that that's what allows people to essentially frame the issues, or how people reported that they did frame the issues. Not in what the content was that was delivered from the planners, but how players actually articulated their responses that gave them the ability to, um, to differently frame and differently trust what was going on in the process. So the other issue, the other part of this is that players trusted in the game and its ability to archive. And this was a sentiment we heard quite a bit. Um, this is from another Detroit player. This is something that you're able to take as hard proof of the opinions of the people who are in the city and share it with people in positions of power. That kind of thing can come out of this data gathering. So one of the things that was interesting is that a lot of people referred back to the fact that even if they said in one breath that, oh, yeah, government isn't listening, in the next breath, yeah, but this is going to be, this is, this is online. We're, we're putting this into a system. And so they ended up trusting in the, in the mediating tool of the, of the game in some ways in, in, a, in a more robust way than they trusted in the organization that was sponsoring the game. And I think that's a really interesting concept to think about is how online interfaces, whether it's a game or not, um, can actually build trust. Um, if it's well designed. Um, so the other thing that, that happens is that people, there was a reimagining of who's listening. So I think that we tend to, or, or, or government sometimes tends to assume that, that what, what people find most meaningful is that governments and decision, government and decision makers are listening. And while that is meaningful, what we found, and this is, again, this is very preliminary data in Philadelphia and haven't really spent much time with it, but I thought it was interesting enough to share here, but I, of course I can't read it on my, yeah. Um, so this was a question, do you agree or disagree the following groups are paying attention to what's happening in Philadelphia? And what's interesting here is that city officials is, you know, the lowest of, uh, of, of all of these, and people tended to say other players um, they had most confidence in, and then in local advocacy and volunteer groups, um, they had the second uh, most confidence in the fact that they were listening. Not that they trusted them, but they were listening. And I think that's a part of, um, of course, that's a part of trust. But what's important here is, is uh, how can we think about um, who, the, who the imagined audiences are for citizens and allow them to connect with those audiences and get government out of the position of simply facilitating connections between government and, um, and citizens. Okay, tied to this is this notion of flexible publics. Um, the online space creates the ability to reimagine traditional publics and audiences uh, to legitimize participation. M much of what I just said, but this has more nuance than that. One of the most interesting findings is the way that youth and adults um, interacted within, within the system. Um, and, and thinking about generational publics and how this online, online, online game allowed in, in a Detroit, for instance, 47% of the players were 18 and under. Um, and so that's a significant amount of young people in a system, in a planning process, where they're typically entirely excluded. Um, in this case, here's a Detroit player, an adult player, says, I think there were kids in the eighth grade doing this. I think like, oh my god, even kids can be involved. I, d I do think kids have to be involved because they're the next generation. We're just ignoring them all the time. Some of their ideas are probably better than a grown-up person could have. Um, and then someone else said, they sound so fresh, so honest, so unbiased. So in some ways, you know, this is you know, a little bit cliche, but what's interesting about it is that this, kind of, this fantasy about youthful exuberance and youthful participation was an important, part about, uh, important way that people framed their own participation. So uh, adults saw... When they legitimized, when many people legitimized their own time spent doing this, the presence of youth in the system allowed them to legitimize that time because it gave them a, this sense of hope that they constructed through, um, through the, the, simply the visualization of youth presence. 
I should say that there was very little interaction between youth and adults. They didn't necessarily chat with each other in the system, but they were very aware of each other's presence. Um, and likewise, it says here, youth, youth, youth spoke about the adult public as uh, legitimate or making the process real for them. So youth tended to really think that the, their main audience was their peers. And again, no surprise. Um, and in some cases, their teachers. But what's really interesting here is that they knew that other adults were listening, and that to them was an important part of it. It wasn't something that drove them to actually interact with adults, but um, it was an important part. Uh, let me, I have just a few more slides that I want to get to. Um, this idea of negotiating public and private, I think, is interesting, especially amongst youth. And I just want to go over one example of, of how this took place. And this was uh, something that happened in Salem that was really interesting. And um, so it's a little hard to read, but uh, it starts up off, up here on the, the top left. And um, this is in response to, uh, to a question. Um, and the response is this. He is right. The point is a disgusting and and none useful place that should be cleaned, and all the people in it should either be deported back to where they came from. Um, OK, and so some of the reactions to this were really interesting. This was from a, a young woman uh, in, in Salem. I think she was in the eighth grade. Um, and the response here is, whoa, um, you're on fire. That was just minutes afterwards. And then some, the next person says, whoa, tone it down a bit. Um, whoa, so harsh. And then a little later in the evening, um, so or these two were in the evening. So, well, someone says I like the website. I don't know where that came from, but um, but then yeah, <laughs> but then down here we have there are some there are some nice places there, Orange Leaf and restaurants and stores. Whoa, um, and then the the original poster says, "Wow, I should really delete this." Um, and then she says, "Sorry if I insulted anyone by this. I didn't realize it was public." Um, <laughs> Oh, I, and, and, then, and then says, I feel really bad about writing this. If I could delete it, I would. And I wasn't talking about all the people in the point, just the mean ones and illegals. Um, <laughs> so that, that aside, the reason I bring this up is that it, it's, a, it's the social policing that took place was really interesting. And her sense of, of who was listening was totally inaccurate um, at first. And, um, and it was this sense that, that she was sort of talking to, I think, um, talking to this, this kind of faceless government entity and, and didn't need to, to censor herself at all in this case. But then when it came, when it, when it came down to it, and people not only within the, within the system but even at school um, became critical of, of, what, of what she had said online, um, then she began to sort of turn around and, and think again about, about what she had said. Um, and rearrange her concept of public. And I think this is a, it's a really interesting thing, not only just uh, of how people interact online, but how online interactions are interfacing with a, with, with a civic culture. Um, finally, the, just to, to conclude about this concept of social learning, um, the game frames learning goals without being too prescriptive. I think that's a big part of what the, um, what the game is attempting to do. Uh, players reported that they learned more from their peers than from the official planning content. So um, someone says, I put my, com uh, my comment and someone disagreed with it. It made me really think, wait, maybe they are right. Even now, I don't really know um, who's right. But I feel like it made me really think about what, what I thought prior. And this was from a BPS player. Um, and I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time. But I just want to go here to lessons. Um, parallel game rules provide channels for social trust. This is a, this is a, a, a kind of conclusion that, that hopefully we can talk about. So the game and the online experience through the, through the various mechanism of flexible audiences and social learning provides a channel for social trust. Um, allowing for more flexible conceptions of audiences can create more legitimacy and force reflection on positions. And then civic learning is motivated by social connections and not merely clear channels between citizens and government. And uh, I will end there. So thank you very much. Yeah, Ryan. Thank you. This was very interesting to hear about all the different uh, projects. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, 
the digital divide and how that plays into this, and not just in the sense of like obviously people who have access to technology to participate in these things versus not, but uh, but more in terms of the fact that you know the divide in terms of you know people who have had lots of experience in online communities uh, and for whom perhaps participation isn't such a leap, or compared to people who maybe either didn't grow up with the stuff or it's you know newer to them or they don't have the same kind of background in these communities and how participation changes or their experiences might be different uh, among those different groups. Right, so just the, the concept of, of uh, what, what Henry Jenkins calls a participation divide and I think that's, that's a really important element here. Um, and, and the way I would say that there's a couple ways that I would respond to that. One, um, that's one of the reasons why I think it's so important to have young people online with adults within these civic processes because young people model and um, and we and we, we found that to be the case that that adult players are often looking to how young people use the system in order to uh, in order to use the system differently um, so that's that that's one thing um, the political issue is different though so on, on one hand you can say well this is um, we're excluding people who are not going to be comfortable um, in this arena, and and that is true. Um, I would say, however, that town hall meetings are also excluding people who are not comfortable in that arena. And I think that the answer at this point is a multimodal approach. And the 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 safe political answer is to avoid online communication, um, especially games, in any way possible. Um, but that's not that's not sustainable because we're 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 not addressing how peop how many people um, are more comfortable participating, and we're not actually building the those participation skills that are going to be important for even even for those people who are not comfortable um, participating in that way. So, so I think that and this is true in all the the, the projects that we've done. It's always paralleled a face to face um, process, and and there are some people who who are. Um, will continue to be much more comfortable in that in that arena, um, and who won't do this at all. I mean, that's we've found that a lot as well. Like the activists in some communities don't do this, um, they do, because they're they're outside of their expertise domain. As a quick follow up, um, are there structural things that you can build into your platforms? So particularly on like the modeling piece that that would encourage modeling versus you know letting the young people just sort of take over. Uh, and to the extent that other people feel excluded from the process, I I think that would be great. Um, <laughs> if I had unlimited development funds, I would. Um, I mean, that would be that would be wonderful. It would it would change the, um, you know, offer more opportunities for learning about you know about about the mechanisms of online participation. I mean, that would be excellent. So, yeah, yeah. Found it interesting in your samples that in all the cases it looked like it was about an average of eight or ten comments per participant, which is great. But I'm also wondering if that's, in, if on average, if that's enough to get people to really have the positive outcomes that you talked about. Do you find that there's a divide of you know, a few people? A lot of people do one or two, but it's the people who have 30 or 40 that are engaged enough to really get the the positive social connection. And, yeah, um, and I don't know how. To well, we're looking at that more now. A lot of people, um, a lot of people don't do anything, yeah. and and I don't know how to deal with them um, because I think they're important. Because I presume, and I and I'm trying to figure out how to actually know this, but I presume that for many of them, they are paying attention. Watching it for they're watching. That's right. Yeah. So it's like the lurker problem, right? Um, and so so a lot of that. I mean, in um, in Philadelphia, for instance, about half. Um, about half of that 920 um, did more than two challenges. Um, so, you know, so that's kind of how we're, we're, we're looking at it. But, and some of those people just signed up and they said, this isn't what I signed up for, and they went away. Um, some of those people did, did a couple and they went away, and then some of them did a lot more. Um, so we're, we're looking at the Philadelphia game right now, and we're going to try to understand sort of percentage of completion, and we're, we're going to go back and try to answer that question. But we didn't do that in the Detroit study, but I think it's a really important one. Um, but, you know, again, it's hard because if we is, it's hard to figure out what the qualities of lurking are and can be. And so if you have ideas about a research design around that, I would love to hear it. <laughs> yes? So with the 
Boston Public School one um, instance, did you, um, who did you mostly have participating? Did you actually have any students participating? Was it teachers? Was it parents? Was it just people in the community? Yes. Oh, what, I mean, was it? It no, was all of the I'm, above. Uh, oh. It was all of the above. Well, I mean, and, like, yeah. what, what percentage of people participated? Oh, I don't you know? have that um, handy, but um, but I can tell you that the the um, I know that the the youth adult breakdown was was about forty percent um, youth in the Boston Public School game. Um, so, but I don't have the amount. I mean, we we did have teachers, and we did have the way that the the game works is. Uh, um, you know, in your profile, we have these things called uh, stakes. So up here we have, we have um, this is my stake. And so in Philadelphia, I was an observer, but I could put residents, I could put business owner, I could put student. Um, and then these are called affiliations, where we allow people to affiliate with neighborhoods or churches or whatever they want to affiliate with. Um, so, you know, people are identifiable in that way to other players and then also later on when we look at the data. Yeah. No, I just wanted to know if it was large chunk, mostly students or mostly just people? Yeah, it was about half and half. And, and the students in, in the Boston um, example were phenomenal. In that, in that case, we had a, a small group of students at a high school in Jamaica Plain called English High that took the lead in a lot of the, um, the development of the content and doing the outreach and organizing the face-to-face. -face. They facilitated the face-to-face -face meetings. They really owned the process in a way that was meaningful both to them but, and also, as I said, to, um, to the adult participants. In fact, one of the um, one of the people who worked for the um, for the school district said to me after the, the the town hall meeting at the end of the the BPS game, she said it was this, it was the most civil meeting that she had ever been to, and I was thinking that part of that may not have anything to do with the game, but the fact that there were kids facilitating things again, people aren't are going to be on good behavior. It's amazing what teenagers can do. Yeah. Have you had any impact on the current Boston public school redesign? And have they engaged with you at all as they move forward having this same old tried and true town hall meetings about redesign? Um, I knew you were going to ask me that. And um, so the Boston case is, is, a, is an interesting and complicated one. And uh, what we were doing in Boston was working towards something called the, uh, the um, um, school performance index. And so they were trying to reevaluate what this index was so that they can use the school performance index to evaluate underperforming schools or, or how well schools are performing. Um, the, the whole thing got mired in a political process. The school performance index never, got, never actually got made. Um, and uh, I'm actually going to look to my colleagues in the city back here, um, Nigel and Chris, who showed up a little late. Um, and and I, I don't know, because you may know a little bit more about what, what happened there than I do or, or what. Um, is there anything to say about that? Yeah, you know, I think it's still an active conversation. And yeah. I think people are very aware of the work that Eric and Carl and the <coughs> which I did um, and have an interest in moving it forward. But Eric's right that at the time we didn't actually um, uh, we didn't sort of come to a policy conclusion shortly after the end of the game. Right. So it's an, it's an interesting challenge. So in that case, we, we did this game. We, um, we in, in, engaged a number of people in learning about what was going on in the school? We connected people to each other in a way that I think and that we know is pretty meaningful, but the process went nowhere. It got politically hooked. Uh, it got po politically hitched up. So, is that a complete failure or not? And it's one of those like um, the, it's the feedback engagement um, dynamic again. And and yes, if, if we can't just say it's okay to have a process that goes nowhere, but occasionally that's going to that's going to happen. And and no matter how we get people to participate, it, it's going to happen. And that was one of the cases where it, it did. Um, and, and we have been in, you know, they, the school district has been undergoing another um, public process, you know, around, around school assignment. Um, and we had some preliminary conversations with them about that. And I, you know, I think it was, it was just hard to work with them to figure out how to engage the public in a, in a deeper way than they did. It is. Yes. In Cambridge, we have an interesting problem where the community is probably more progressive about these sort of issues than sort of the political and the planning class. I mean, Nigel has been to Cambridge City Council committee meetings and preached the gospel, and it just has no traction. So I'm wondering if you had any experience or aware of examples of grassroots groups engaging this way um, as community organizing rather than being sponsored through 
you know, the, the, the various bureaucracies. Sure. I mean, there's there's lots of examples. I mean, I would, I would point you to some of the excellent work happening in the city of Detroit, for instance, around community organizations that are um, grassroots community organizations that are um, that are creatively using art and digital tools to, to connect uh, to people. Um, so and, you know, and, and these things are happening. These things are happening everywhere on smaller scales. Uh, so it's it's not like it's not like they're not. And, and you could do some of that collective efficacy um, building. Um, you can you can do some of that neighborhood connectedness work through through that for sure. Um, neighborhood storytelling. I know there's some really interesting work happening in Los Angeles around around local neighborhood storytelling. Um, so it, it's happening in all all different sectors. I mean, this this work in particular is is focus is trying to focus on the public sector writ large and to try to understand how how this context is um, uh, underperforming and how it can perform in other ways. So I th and I think it 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 is copacetic. It works alongside these these community organizations and the work that they're doing. Yeah. Uh, well, some of my questions have already been answered, but um, you mentioned something earlier about gamification and how do you see this engaging with that? Well, um, I mean, gamification is a troubling word, and maybe, and and it's. Um, I think there's a, like on one hand, I think gamification get, often gets used as, it's, the criticism of gamification is that it's that it's simply adding points and badges to an existing thing and and you call it a day. Um, I like to I, I'm hope I hope that what we're doing is is creating um, games that can that are um, that have a structure beyond that that can also uh, connect to existing civic processes. And the the game that we're trying to the, the game that we're trying to build here um, is is one that I think is really important for its effectiveness. So, for instance, as I said, the the uh, the ability to visualize outcomes, the um, having some sort of challenge, whether that the some sort of difficulty to it, whether that be um, the time based or um, or the the uh, the trivia challenges, the the things that are that are that are difficult, the competition element um, that allows for um, some allows for people to actually immerse themselves within those challenges. Um, I think that's really important. The narrative component, which again doesn't have to be game based, but but narrative, um, but a game can can structure a game. I'm sorry, a game can structure a narrative quite well. Um, and and then the sort of participatory aspect of it, which is the um, how people role play within um, within the uh, within the game. So the fact that people sort of um, took on their uh, a sort of personal goal to defeat the Kratz, for instance, I think was an important part of this. Um, the fact that that we introduced characters that were outside of um, that outside of the player characters that actually gave it a sense of uh, gave it a sense of play and discovery. I think those are all elements that are that are absolutely central to the work that 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 we're doing, and I hope um, takes it beyond the the kind of loosely knit participatory qualities, the transactive qualities um, that that. Um, sort of Gov, Gov 2.0 is focused to at this point a lot on um, to the civic learning capacity where we can use that very well structured concept of the game to, to bring people into a meaningful experience. Yeah. So the Detroit Future Work Project, is that what you were involved with that we, Kresge just gave $150 million So to? we worked with the, um, um, it's, the Detroit Detroit Works was Detroit the name of the organization, Works, right, and they right. produced a report called Detroit Future City. Right, yeah. right. And as many of us know, coming from Michigan and being the daughter of a mayor, um, there, Detroit is is about to have an emergency manager, um, which Maybe is Mitt another. Maybe Mitt Romney, I understand. <laughs> oh God, yeah. really? Yeah, oh, I said that this morning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My dad was mayor of the capital of Michigan when his father was governor, and there's no relationship between the two. George was a lot cooler than Mitt. Um, what would be? Are you are you going to continue your involvement there, or is that like a done deal? Or it seems to me that it would be even more important under sort of a. Um, uh, transitional leadership situation where you have this kind of, as with the Boston Public Schools, I mean, the court was very much involved, you know, 30 years ago. They were the final arbiter of what was going to happen in the, in the school system. Um, have you thought about that in terms of where you're dealing with a receiver or a leadership situation, where the leadership situation undergoes 
profound change, which may call forth an even more urgent need for community <coughs> engagement to right. offset the power imbalance between central and neighborhoods. So this is a, this is a I'm going to give you a roundabout answer um, to this question, which is um, it's hard to know how to, so what, what we have is a, is a, software, a software platform coming from a research lab. And, um, and what, to what extent can we when, we, when we work with the community, to what extent is it ongoing? And who should maintain those relationships once we've started them with the community? Um, what's that? It's the P word, politics. Well, right. So there's all of those things involved here. And, and we're trying to figure out now, so we're trying to figure out how to get Community Planet as a platform just out there and usable. Um, and we're trying, to, we're trying to figure out how to best scale it up um, in a way that doesn't involve us. And, and so that's been the, that, that's been the challenge, is what, is what is the free model of something like Community Planet where I'm not invested um, personally in, in all the community work that's happening on a local level wherever it's happening, where, um, where we've developed this platform, we, we, um, you know, we, we've learned a lot about, about how, um, how the qualities of, of social networks and, and online games can interface with, with, um, with a local civic context. And now, in a way, we, I want to figure out how to let it go. And this is a longer conversation. I could have done this entire uh, lunch talk about uh, how, to build a, um, how to build an open business model around a, a research project. Um, so you know, so, th so that's, that's not, but I think it's a big issue. So I'd love to keep working in Detroit. But you know, there is limited resources. And, and so we're trying to figure all that out now. We, I, you know, I'd love to keep working in Salem and Philadelphia. But at some point, it just has to get used. Um, and, and it has to help people within the local context and not, not me. Uh, yes? Um, really interesting talk. You set us up basically with this fundamental question about, you know, what, what do you do about participation as fake engagement um, versus participation as kind of meaningful influence? Um, and I think this is a great example of how people could kind of have fun engaging with stuff. But the fact is, planning processes are incredibly, for most of us, incredibly boring processes. There are basically paperwork, there's paragraphs to read, there's particular points at which you can engage and, and invoke some statutory rights and so on. And, and part of the engagement in, uh, for, for community groups with that is actually almost like a, um, a self-taught uh, learning about how that process works and at which points you can actually influence that process. So what I'd be interested in is, is how can you build into a fun process or a, a fun game yeah. sort of that learning about what is actually quite a boring kind of procedural route and uh, thereby actually teach people at what point they can actually make a difference if they hit that particular button in that process. So it's one of the, the in the game there are these, that there are resources that exist within the game for instance and those resources can be things like GIS maps, they could be planning documents, they could be all that boring stuff you're talking about. And we try to formulate challenges so that we, we, we get people to have to read those resources so that they can best answer the challenge. Um, and we do that more effectively with trivia. So we, the, we use the trivia questions. We actually have data that is within maps that are, are in the system that the answer is there. You just have to open it up and, and look, at the, look at the resource and you can, answer the, you can answer the trivia question and get it right. So every step of the way, every challenge has some some learning outcome that's desired. So it's not simply about what do you think, but it's about, you know, let's learn about, uh, here's, a, here's some information about, um, about the, the flow of buses in this area. Now let's answer, now I want to hear your opinion about um, how the buses work in this area. So we're trying to relate those things together at every step. And that's part of the design challenge when doing, when putting in the content for any particular game, it's about thinking about learning outcomes, which is something that planners don't often do. Um, but, it's, but it's definitely something that the game is set up to do. Um, and now what you're saying, the other piece of that is, can, you, can that learning build to advocacy? Can that learning build to people being able to, um, um, to make change? And that's, that's another question that I'm interested in. Um, you know, how we move from, from one to the other. And, and a quick um, answer to that is that within the game, I mentioned there are causes um, that get funded. So you take your coins and you put them onto causes. 
Um, and some of those, you start, every game starts with a couple preloaded causes, and then, and then players can upload their own causes. And uh, like in Philadelphia, the, one of the winning causes was this woodland tree fund. And, um, and they wanted to a plant a bunch of trees. And so they, earned, they, they won $500. But what was cool about it is that there was a difference in how people responded to the challenges that were in the, that were in the game and how people advocated for their causes within the cause section of the game. So there was different kinds of political talk. You know, on one hand, there was the talk that was, um, this, is, this is what I think and this is how I understand this process. On another hand, there was personal advocacy. There was the, like, you have to support this. And that was really interesting. And there was much more passion in the advocacy part. And one of the things that we're looking at now is what the relationship is between the kind, the, these various kinds of political talk. So on one hand, there's um, the talk that is more uh, connected to official processes. And then there's the advocacy talk. And, and how do people see the connections um, between those things? And how can we design to make those connections more meaningful? So if we believe that advocacy should come from a place of learning, then how do we make that flow? Uh, how do we design for that flow? I think we have yeah, yeah, maybe the last one. Last question, OK. Um, so what kind of analytics are incorporated with this, if any? And what are your plans for the future, if not? So I, I didn't show you. Um, I want to show you something real quickly. Um, let's see if I can find it. Um, so one of the things that we do, we, we just completed this, I don't know if it's going to show up well, but this data visualization thing. So you can take any, here's a challenge from the Philadelphia game. And, um, and you can, so this just allows you to, to look at the, you know, what somebody put in. Um, oh, shoot, I can't see it on my screen. Uh. We're singing a piano, is that what you want to show us? <laughs> yeah, but I want to show you, um, let's see if okay. they're allow me to do this. Okay, so here I can, here's the response, and this is like the people who are educators, and this is, this is how they responded. And then what we did was we, um, we did, um, these are negative comments. This is just some, uh, we don't know how good it is yet, but these are, these are negative comments. These are positive. This is the, the size of the bubble is how influential it was. Um, but you can combine it into, like, here's people 18 to 30, um, you know, and, and look at things this way. And this is all for a particular challenge. So, um, ah, that's not going away. Um, so yeah, so we, they were doing this, and then we we're also, we were also um, making this available, so word clouds around particular challenges, so you can look at any challenge and see the, um, see the bubbles, or, and, and this is neat, um, which is something that you, know, you have to do. But, um, <laughs> but then you can, see the, you can see the word cloud, and then you can see, like, you can use these as keywords. So okay, so in this challenge, who said stuff about food? And then you can sort of separate it off and look at it that way. So, and this is all stuff that, that is going to be made available to communities. So the idea is we're doing some basic analytics here. We're making this available to people. In the town hall meetings, it's all about analyzing this data so we can do that publicly, sort of performatively. Um, and then we want to give that over to communities. And we're actually giving them the anonymized Excel spreadsheets as well. Um, and so the hope is that we can, you know, this is building a bunch of, commu of community data that can hopefully be an asset for a community who wants to take it. So will they also well, this is, a web, this is a web tool that has all the game data in it already that they will have access to. And all the Excel spreadsheet is in this, oh, and then, yeah, all the Excel spreadsheet is already in here, and then the Excel spreadsheet is also downloadable from the site. All right, so with that, uh, please join me in thanking Eric for a great talk. Thank you.